thing every five seconds. Um, but the idea that everyone has a story is really, really important. So um, I dropped out of the book club, since we weren't reading any books anyway, and I decided to just read memoirs. Um, so for like a year and a half, I just went through one memoir after another. So after reading all these memoirs, my favorites have come to be um, The Liars Club by Mary Carr, and also she wrote a follow-up to that called Cherry, which was, if you have a teenage child, I don't know, you might want to either read it quickly before they become a teenager or wait until after, because it's pretty harsh. Um, and A Girl Called Zippy by Haven Kimmel. And then I really liked David Sedaris and Augustine Burroughs, who are very funny. Um, so as the fight with the in-laws dragged on, um, I tried to read some books about religion, figuring maybe if I understood it better, I could figure it out more. So I read Karen Armstrong's History of God, although I have to say I didn't actually finish it. Um, and I always felt really guilty about not having finished that book. I, I carried it around for like a year and never finished it. And then I was on a panel with Christopher Hitchens um, in 07, and um, he said that Karen Armstrong wouldn't know a point if she sat on it. <laughs> so somehow that made me feel better, although I don't know if I agree with him. But, um, she did write an excellent memoir called The Spiral Staircase, which is about how she um, left the order, I guess, because she stopped being a nun. She became a nun when she was very young, so it's a very interesting book. And I've even read C.S. Lewis, so I feel like I should get my little star on my forehead for that. And then I read books about Buddha. Um, actually, Karen Armstrong wrote a nice book about the Buddha. And then um, I tried to read some books about Islam, um, but I didn't really get very far in any of the... It wasn't really what I wanted. I didn't want that kind of, like, you know, book about the religion as much as I thought I did. So, so I was kind of trying to figure out why religion kept... I was so compelled in this fight with these people. I mean, these were my in-laws. I'm not talking about my sister. I'm talking about my husband's sister. Could, don't you think I could just hang up the phone and say, piss off? No. I kept picking the phone back up. So why? Because there's a certain point when if you keep doing the same destructive thing, you might want to think, why am I doing this? So, I, all right. So I, something about religion was just pulling me in and pulling me in. So I, I, I had to go to a PTA meeting, and I had a babysitter. Now, when you have a babysitter, you can't go home, because then the children see you, and you have to start this whole goodbye thing again, and it takes like an hour. So I had time between work and the PTA meeting. I went to the bar and had a beer and just sucked a lot of mints afterwards so that the other moms wouldn't think I was a wash. <laughs> um, and it was a beautiful May day, and, and the light was filtering through like the new leaves. It was just one of those really nice afternoons in, in, in New York. Um, and I sat there and I said, you know what, let me just make a list of all the times that I have come into contact with, or brushed up against, or intersected with religion. Because clearly there's something in my history that is keeping me in this loop. And so I wrote down all these things that I could remember from my childhood and adult, um, adulthood and then adulthood. And oddly enough, the list looked like chapters of a book. As a matter of fact, the list is pretty much the chapters of this book with some minor adjustments along the way. But it was really kind of alarming that this list just kind of popped out like that. Um, but I was afraid to write, I was afraid to even try to write, and I certainly wasn't going to tell anybody that I was thinking of doing this because, I don't know about around here, but in New York there's nothing more annoying than people talking about the projects that they're not doing. So I decided to not, you know, talk about the book unless it was actually happening. So for the whole summer I walked around with my journal, with my list, and I'd look at it, and I'd sort of put it back, you know, under my bed or whatever. And I only told one friend about it. And she said, oh, I know you can do this. I know you can do this. Just, you know, you have to get up at like 6 o'clock in the morning and write for an hour before anybody else gets up. Well, that's not going to happen. <laughs> and so I had to figure out, you know, if I could even get anything down on the page. And, and, and I, it was really funny because I was very much afraid to even start. 
So then, the following October, both my kids were homesick. Day is shot. Can't do anything. You're just nursing sick children and bringing them juice, and you really want to strangle them. But um, finally, they both like went to sleep. And I thought, well, the day's completely shot, so let me try to write this thing that I've been thinking about. Because if I fail, like, well, what difference does it make? The day's crap anyway. And I sat down and I wrote what I just read to you. I basically wrote that, the first couple of pages of that, that's what is now the second chapter. And I, I was just, like, shocked that it just came sort of, sort of spilling out. And so I kept writing, and then I wrote the next chapter, and I'd send it to my husband at work. That was my way of backing up, by the way, computer people. <laughs> my way of backing up was sending it to my husband's office. Then he had it there. If my computer crashed, he still had it. So, um, so he would read it on the subway coming home, and, and then he'd say, good, just keep writing. Uh, and I did. And I finished the very rough draft in February. And then I had uh, to rewrite it. Um, and so I rewrote it, and I had a pretty good, solid draft in July of 03. So that's when I started to tell people, you know, that I had something that maybe they could, if they wanted to, read it, like the manuscript. And then I sent out 75 query letters to various agents and publishers, and I got 50 no's, 23 no answers, one maybe. And finally, one yes from Prometheus. That was very exciting. Because once you get the yes, that's all you need. So um, how does my book fit in with the other atheist books out there that I mentioned, that you probably are all very familiar with? And what's my relationship to the other authors, or how is my voice different? Well, my book is about living life as an atheist, whereas, and I do use that word to describe myself. Um, versus the other books which are mostly about atheism. Um, so at one point my subtitle was a memoir of being, because I just sort of wanted it to just be, you know. Um, and I didn't set out to write a handbook, a how-to, or any kind of philosophical treatise um, about belief or non-belief, and I never intended to make an argument for atheism. Rather, I wanted to give a voice and a face to what I saw as an ever more reviled portion of our society. And I really am an optimist, and I'm an optimist with a memory, which I have to point out, because I think a lot of optimists actually are optimistic because they don't remember how bad it was last time, but I do remember, but I still think it's going to be better. <laughs> Just one more time, I know we can do it. Um, so I really thought we could, I could make us less hated and more understood just by telling my kind of normal story and being nice, you know, and, and friendly. Um, so I don't really offer a point of view uh, about atheism in the book. Um, because it really, I did want it to be a story about how to live your life kind of to the fullest. I mean, not to sound too corny, but, you know, you're, you kind of are struggling against all the bad feelings that are out there about you, so you're sort of just trying to be who you are in a, an atheist in a world that, that hates, ha hates atheists. Um, and I only use the word atheist in the introduction to the book. I really don't, I don't really talk so much about it in the rest of the book. And um, I tried to be tempered in my anger toward them, toward the other side, including my in-laws, and not write a polemic about, my way, about why my way is right and everyone else's way is wrong. Because in the end, I think that point of view can really only make atheists more reviled. Um, I wanted the face that I gave us to be friendly. Your neighbor, someone you know from work, a mom on the local playground, or maybe even a member of your family. But don't get me wrong, because I'm angry. I am angry. I'm very sick of the supposition that everyone is a believer. And I'm especially now, tired of politicians pandering to the religious of the country. You know, I really did have hope that maybe Obama would not be, you know, all Christ this and Jesus that, but I still hope that once he gets elected, he's going to be like, oh, and by the way, <laughs> I just did that to get elected. Um, and I'm really sick 
of the constant rewriting of history so that anyone who was good and did anything worthwhile was a believer like the founding fathers.